excited to start out our student speaker series with Josh Craddock. Josh is a 3L here, as everyone who knows him knows. Really smart guy, great all-around person. Really excited to hear what you have to say. Great. Thanks so much, Jeanette. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks to the HLS Republicans for having me here today. It's an honor to talk about uh, my note with you all, and I think it's a it's a good time to talk about this note because, uh, as we've seen from the last term, Justice Gorsuch has found himself aligned with uh, Justice Thomas on many issues and proven himself to be an originalist in much the same way that his uh, predecessor was. What is an originalist? Well, it means that the judge seeks to ascertain the original meaning of the text and to apply it faithfully. But I want to raise a question about whether Justice Gorsuch will be a more consistent originalist than his predecessor in, with respect to abortion. Now, that might be a, a little bit of an impertinent question and perhaps a little bit presumptuous coming as it is from a mere law student questioning you know, one of the greatest single minds of the last half century. But I think that there are some good reasons to revisit the question. Other legal thinkers have looked at whether the Constitution protects the unborn on living constitutional grounds from our broadening notions of equality or human dignity. Yale law professor Jack Balkin has explored whether a national right to abortion can be justified on originalist grounds and came to the conclusion that it can under his understanding of originalist interpretation. And the late Justice Scalia articulated the position that there is no right to abortion affirm uh, affirmatively enshrined in the Constitution, but it doesn't prohibit it either. But the idea that the Constitution affirmatively prohibits abortion on originalist grounds hasn't really been closely considered before. The late Justice Scalia wrote in his Planned Parenthood versus Casey opinion, quote, the Constitution says absolutely nothing about abortion. In his view, the 14th Amendment's guarantees of due process and equal protection for all persons did not encompass prenatal life. Instead, the question of abortion, he thought, should be decided state by state in the democratic and political processes through democratic choice. In a 2008 interview, Justice Scalia opined, there are anti-abortion people who think that the Constitution requires a state to prohibit abortion. They say the Equal Protection Clause requires you to treat a helpless human being that's still in the womb the way you treat other human beings. I think that's wrong. I think that when the Constitution says that persons are entitled to equal protection of the laws, I think it clearly means walking around persons. Leave aside for a moment the observation that if the Constitution only protects walking around persons, then it does by implication have something to say about the status of abortion. Let's leave that aside. The question I want to focus on is, does the Constitution really only protect walking around <coughs> persons under an originalist interpretation? Or is there a compelling originalist rejoinder by examining the original meaning of the term person as used in the 14th Amendment? I attempt to do that in my article, uh, pr Protecting Prenatal Persons, Does the 14th Amendment Prohibit Abortion? Published in the last volume of the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. The structure of my argument is pretty simple. First, the 14th Amendment's use of the term person guarantees due process and equal protection to all members of the human species within the geographic and jurisdictional power of the Constitution. Second, the preborn are members of the human species from the moment of fertilization. Therefore, the 14th Amendment protects the preborn from fertilization. And I don't want to get bogged down on the minor premise that preborn human beings are biological members of the human family. I'd like to stipulate that it's scientifically well established that unborn human beings are members of the species Homo sapiens from fertilization. So if you'll indulge me in laying aside for a moment that minor premise, all that must be demonstrated is that the term person in its original public meaning at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption applied to all members of the human species. I want to draw on three strands of evidence to reach that conclusion. First, dictionaries of common and legal usage at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption included uh, defined person interchangeably with human being, or man. This, thus, the original public meaning of the term person included every member of the human race. Furthermore, the use of the term person in statutes and court cases referred specifically to the unborn as persons in many cases. Second, Centuries of common law precedent and state practice leading up to the adoption of the 14th Amendment in 1868 indicates that the unborn were considered legal persons. And third, the authors of the 14th Amendment expected it to protect every human being, especially the most weak and marginalized. 
This original expected application isn't conclusive of the original meaning, but it is indicative. And it demonstrates that informed citizens believe that the text of the 14th Amendment applied to every human being without exception. So I'll address each of these points in turn. First, let's start with the text. <coughs> Dictionaries of common legal usage, as I mentioned, define the uh, term person as interchangeable with human being or man. I'll give you a few examples. The 1864 Noah Webster's Dictionary of the English Language defined the term person as, quote, relating especially to a living human being, a man, woman, or child, unquote. The entry for human includes all those belonging to, quote, the race of man. No dictionary of the era referenced birth or the status of being born in its definition of what a human being, a person, or a man was. In legal usage, the term had expansive scope. Alexander Burrell's uh, New Law Dictionary and Glossary defined person as, quote, a human being considered as the subject of rights as distinguished from a thing. And that's consistent with Blackstone, for whom there is no distinction between legal personhood and biological humanity. Blackstone wrote in his Discourse on the Rights of Persons in the Authoritative Commentaries on the Laws of England that natural persons are, quote, such as the God of nature formed us, Echoing the words of the psalmist in Psalm 139, uh, speaking of God, you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Blackstone declared that life is, quote, a right inherent by nature in every individual, and it begins in contemplation of law as soon as an infant is able to stir in its mother's womb. Now, as I explained in my article, this mention of the unborn child stirring was intended to protect prenatal life as soon as it could be detected. You may have heard of this as the quickening standard. The principle to draw is not to uh, is, is the idea that human life was protected as soon as it could be dis discerned, and it wasn't designed to exclude protection of life prior to that point. It's proper to derive the principle from Blackstone and other legal authorities of the era that if life could be shown to exist, legal personhood existed also. So now that we're equipped to understand what the term person meant at the time of the amendment's adoption, let's look at how it's actually used in the text of the amendment. The opening phrase of the 14th Amendment, quote, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, does not define the scope of the class persons. Rather, born or naturalized and subject to the jurisdiction thereof serve to narrow that broader class to which persons refers. Prior to the adoption of the amendment, for example, foreign nationals, uh, Native Americans, and even African slaves were considered persons. In fact, the term person has always been larger than its subset, citizen. And the Supreme Court's long-standing 14th Amendment jurisprudence bears that out. You can think of the late 1800s case, Yipuo versus Hopkins, which reflects that traditional understanding. So just as Blackman's, uh, Blackman's intratextual analysis in Roe v. Wade and his concluding observation that the usage of the term person has, quote, application only postnatally, I think draws an unsupported conclusion from the text. Justice Blackman went through every instance of the term person throughout the, con uh, the Constitution to try and show that it, it never once uh, had application postnatally. But it's very difficult to prove what a word couldn't mean through negative inference alone. That's a point that Akhil Amar has made. Uh, specifically with reference to Blackman's intratextual analysis in Roe. To illustrate the problem, you could draw an opposite and equally unsupported conclusion from the text by using the phrase persons born or naturalized in that section one. You could say that the adjective naturalized indicates that there are persons who are not naturalized, and that born might function the same way by implying that there are persons not born. It, uh, I think that that <coughs> is just as defensible as the one that Justice Blackman advances in Roe, which is to say, not very defensible. Now, before we turn to the next line of evidence, I want to point out that at this point, I think my case is proven. The term person in 1868 definitively included all human beings. So whether or not the states historically uh, understood that the unborn specifically were human beings doesn't matter, so long as they believe that all human beings were entitled to protection under the 14th Amendment. So to borrow from Justice Scalia here, just as freedom of speech protects movies or internet communications under an originalist interpretation, even though those technologies didn't exist at the time of the First Amendment's adoption, the term person protects every member of the human species regardless of whether individuals 
as were recognized at that time as members of the human family. The, member, the, the meaning of the relevant text doesn't evolve, it's simply being applied to a new set of circumstances given new information. But as it turns out, the states did affirmatively, historically believe that the unborn were living members of the human family. That leads me to my second line of evidence, which is common law precedent and state practice on abortion. The English common law tradition, which the United States inherited and developed after independence, consistently treated abortion as the wrongful taking of human life. Abortion was prohibited as soon as life in the womb could be detected. Prior to the advent of modern medical science, unborn life was detected at quickening, as I've mentioned, the first perceived fetal movement. This was a useful evidentiary tool for determining whether the crime of abortion had occurred, because there was a lot of difficulty at that time in proving that a child was actually alive prior to quickening, and that therefore the crime of abortion had actually occurred. Proving the, the, the fact that the child was actually alive was necessary to prove the crime of abortion, which is why this rule took hold. Legal giants such as Lord Cook and Blackstone formalized those legal principles protecting prenatal life, and that, those were inherited by the American colonies and eventually adopted into their state common law and statutes. When embryologists discovered in around the 1830s that each individual human being begins his or her life cycle of fertilization, the states actually <coughs> rapidly discarded that obsolete quickening standard in, in light of the new medical evidence and adopted a fertilization standard. I'll give you a few examples of this. For example, uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in 1850 ruled that, quote, the moment the womb is instinct with embryo life and gestation has begun, the crime of abortion may be perpetrated. There was, therefore, a crime at common law, unquote. I think that that passage is indicative of the national mood about abortion during that period. In fact, just one year later, the Supreme Judicial Court of Maine had a decision in their 1851 case, Smith v. State, they upheld a statute that discarded that old quickening standard in favor of the new information. By the time that the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, the states widely treated unborn <coughs> as human beings. 23 states and 6 territories referred to the fetus as a child in their anti-abortion statutes. 28 listed abortion in their statutory offenses against the person, or a functionally equivalent classification within their criminal statutes. In a particularly striking example, actually, the same Ohio legislature that ratified the 14th Amendment in 1867 in January passed legislation criminalizing abortion in all stages just three months later, in April of 1867. The committee that reviewed the bill, which was composed of several senators who had actually cast votes in favor of ratifying the amendment, declared in their report that abortion, quote, at any stage of existence is child murder. Now, some scholars, like Yale law professor Rita Siegel, have argued that this wave of anti-abortion statutes during the 14th Amendment adoption period was actually motivated not in any interest of protecting prenatal life, but simply to uh, close off reproductive choices for women and to regulate women's health. But I think that that view is inconsistent with the fact that during the time these anti-abortion statutes were being adopted, they, they actually increased the penalty for abortion if it were proved to have caused the unborn child's death, and a majority did so irrespective of gestation, before or after quickening. Maine, among other states, deemed abortion fatally detected, uh, defective uh, if the prosecution didn't allege the actual destruction of the unborn child. So I think that evinces a concern for the prenatal life and not si simply a, a broader concern about women's health. The third line of evidence that I want to briefly consider is the amendment's anticipated application. The framers of the amendment themselves certainly thought that their amendment required due process for every human being. And while the intentions of the drafters and, and framers of the 14th Amendment don't directly govern the meaning of the text, they are persuasive evidence to show what they understood the text to mean, and therefore it's indicative of what the original public meaning was. It's worth considering whether the radically inclusive amendment could be interpreted to exclude a subset of individuals who were considered human beings at the time that the amendment was written, and who we now know, more than ever, to be members of the human family. The primary framer of the 14th Amendment, Representative John Bingham, believed that the amendment prevented states from refusing, quote, any of the rights which pertain to common humanity. Senator Jacob Howard, who sponsored the amendment in the Senate, 
emphasized that the amendment guaranteed even the lowest and most despised members of the human race equal protection of the laws. And during congressional debates, Representative James Brown rhetorically asked, quote, does the term person carry with it anything further than a simple allusion to the existence of the individual? I think the drafters of the 14th Amendment carefully crafted the text to include all human beings within the jurisdictional power of the Constitution, regardless of their origin, circumstance, or condition. As Justice Hugo Black would later put it, the history of the 14th Amendment proves that the people were told its purpose was to protect weak and helpless human beings. The widely shared belief of the framers of the 14th Amendment, I think, sheds light on the amendment's public meaning at the time of its adoption. The 14th Amendment was meant to be a new birth of freedom for all human beings. So what does this mean for our current regime of abortion on demand through pretty much all nine months of pregnancy as established by Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton? In his Roe majority opinion, Justice Harry Blackman acknowledged that if personhood is established, then the constitutional right to abortion, quote, collapses, for the fetus's right to life would then be guaranteed specifically by the amendment. Under an originalist interpretation of the Constitution, the edifice supporting Roe and its progeny completely collapses. Given the original public meaning of the term person, then, the contemporaneous anti-abortion statutes that were purposed to protect prenatal life, and the public explanations of the framers of the 14th Amendment as to its scope of meaning, I think the historical evidence supports extending protections to prenatal life on originalist grounds. You might be wondering, though, where's the state action here, right? We know that instances of private violence don't necessarily rise to a constitutional violation. Even if the unborn are included within the term person, how could it be that there's any you know, state action that would make this a 14th Amendment violation? Well, as you know, a state's failure to protect individual against private violence doesn't normally constitute a violation of the Due Process Clause. You might recall the DeShane versus Winnebago County case in which an omission by the state was not deemed state action when the actual private violence was inflicted by, I believe it was a foster or adoptive father or stepfather. But the DeShane Court qualified its holding by recognizing that, quote, the state may not, of course, selectively deny its protective services to certain disfavored minorities without violating the Equal Protection Clause. So if constitutional protections, if the meaning of the term person does include the unborn, then a state could not refuse to prosecute the intentional killing of the unborn systematically while continuing to pros prosecute the murders of other classes of persons within its jurisdiction. In light of the evidence, I think that that is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Similarly, if courts refuse to appoint guardians ad litem for unborn uh, children whose interests diverge from, say, their parents, then that would be a violation of due process. Judge John Noonan, in his book, The Morality of Abortion, goes through a series of cases in pre, the pre-Roe period in which guardians ad litem were appointed to protect the property interests and the medical interests of unborn children. So if an unborn child could have its property interests protected as a, by a guardian ad litem, then it seems strange that his or her right to life would not be protected uh, by the appointment of a guardian ad litem. So in light of all the evidence, I think that the Supreme Court has to reverse course on abortion on originalist grounds. But even if you're convinced of all that, so what? There are only two justices on the Supreme Court that are identifiably originalist in their method, right? Justice Thomas and now Justice Gorsuch. So without a majority on the court who might be persuaded by such arguments, what is the path forward for extending constitutional protections to the unborn? I think that each branch and level of government has a role to play here. So the executive, first, should assert his departmental authority to interpret and uphold the Constitution. The president should fulfill his constitutional duty to, quote, take care that the laws be faithfully executed. This may, and should include, in my opinion, a rejection of the notion of judicial supremacy, the idea that Roe v. Wade is the law of the land. I don't want to get bogged down too deeply on this point because it's not the direct topic of my paper. But the president swears an oath to uphold, the, uh, to uphold and preserve the Constitution, not every pronouncement of the Supreme Court. Secondly, Congress should act under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to enforce by appropriate legislation the Constitution's protection for unborn persons, such as through a Life at Conception Act, which is frequently being introduced in the House and the Senate. Finally, 
the states retain the primary duty to protect the inalienable rights of all human beings within their jurisdictions, the foremost of which is, of course, the right to life. States have a responsibility to exercise their police powers, that is, their, their, public, um, their, their authority to regulate public health, safety, and morals, to prohibit abortion. <laughs> State governors and legislators should do everything in their power to uphold the U.S. Constitution on this point. I think candidates like Dan Fisher, who's currently running for uh, governor of Oklahoma, is an example to the rest of the states on this point. He hasn't been punting the issue and saying that there's nothing that the states can do about it because of the Supreme Court ruling. So states that have considered uh, personhood amendments and legislation, I think, are also an encouraging part of this trend in that direction, and I hope that we continue to see that play out. Until the Supreme Court, the people or their elected representatives undo the caste system of separate and unequal treatment for unborn persons, I don't think that there can truly be equal protection under the law for all human beings within the United States. The legal regime that discriminates against preborn human beings should be abolished on originalist grounds, restoring the harmony between science and law in a manner consistent with the Constitution. Thank you so much.